So I think to understand why physics um, enters this um, topic, um, we should go back to, um, I don't know, a couple of hundred years and look at the situation of, of how people were discussing free will or consciousness um, in those times. And so um, when you think of those times, then um, our material body wasn't um, the most important part of the subject at all. So I think most thinkers of, of um, human condition, of, of, of consciousness in those times, were conceiving of human um, humans or, or people or persons um, as consisting of two uh, kind of primitive, um, I don't know, substances or, or things. Um, you had your body, and that's the material part of your being. And then the other thing um, that gave life to that material body was um, something that people were perhaps calling soul or, or something. That was the, that was the seat of, of um, what we nowadays would call consciousness or mind. That was the thing that gave life to that otherwise lifeless material part of your being. Um, and so, um, in those times, um, physics would not have been as important to understanding what consciousness, consciousness is. But um, as we know, then over the last hundred of, of couple of hundred years, um, something called the scientific revolution happened, and so the paradigm of, of how we conceive of human beings has shifted considerably. So nowadays, um, I think most researchers would think of um, humans um, in terms of their um, material bodies. So matter is the primary source of, of consciousness um, and basically everything. So this is why, and, and what is the best way to study matter? That's physics. And so if we think of what kind of um, constraints um, the body kind of is governed by, then we turn to physics and try to understand how the brain and everything is, is, is um, how to say, put together and governed. And so physics is, is, is going to tell us how our consciousness operates. So that's why we nowadays perhaps um, think physics as, as, as being um, one of the most important sources of, of, of how to understand consciousness and free will, because free will is, is linked to consciousness, um, um, I don't know, inextricably. <laughs> Again, when you look back to, to um, history, then one of the first theories that kind of arose was uh, Newtonian mechanics. And um, it became immensely powerful. It became so powerful that, for instance, I think Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, actually thought that this is the ultimate theory of, of um, the universe, of physics and integrated it into his philosophy. He said, I think he says something like, um, the structure of space is given by Newtonian theory. Um, so, and when you think, in, when you think of, um, of physics in this sense, then um, people started to um, kind of um, apply mechanics um, to everything we know of. And the idea gradually arose that there is nothing else than mechanics, that um, if we think of everything as, as um, um, consisting of um, point particles, um, uh, for instance, um, our bodies um, consist of point particles, or can it be thought of as consisting of small particles, which are governed by um, ultimate by, um, um, mechanics, then when you look at the laws of uh, mechanics, then they tell you that 
if we know the current state of the universe or that physical system that we're interested in, then um, its future is fixed and also its past. So this is a very, this is an example of a very strong notion of determinism. Um, and so um, the idea is then that um, if um, we think of people mostly in terms of um, um, matter and consisting of matter, and matter is what, what um, um, is our consciousness, then in order to find out what is free will, what is consciousness, what is free will, we have to um, rely on laws of physics. And if mechanics gives us laws of physics, then, um, and if mechanics is de deterministic, then everything we did, um, or everything that we will do, is actually determined by those laws. And so, um, at, the end, at the end of the day, there's nothing called free will, actually. If physics consisted only of um, mechanics, classical mechanics, then, then in that case, I think we, we, we would be done. But um, as it happens, physics actually contains many different theories. So physics is actually not uh, one single framework. Instead, it's, it's like a family of different frameworks. And there's different theories, different frameworks characterize different aspects or features of, of our um, world. Um, so classical mechanics is the theory of billiard, billiard balls, um, chairs and tables, and if you want to build a bridge, then you definitely have to use classical mechanics. So classical mechanics is a hugely useful theory, um, and it's used all over the place nowadays um, to build various things that we actually can touch. But um, there are more things in the world. For instance, um, there is electricity and magnetism, um, light. And mechanics is not able to, to describe what happens with light, for instance. So at the end of the 19th century, um, a different theory arose, which is called electromagnetism. And that theory was created to describe how um, electrical, magnetical um, phenomena um, behave in the world. Um, but then gradually, uh, people started to realize that, um, that um, matter indeed consists of small things. Um, and initially they were thought of as being small billiard balls, you know, the small balls that um, um, collide and, and just uh, move fast um, through space. But um, mechanics, it, it turns out mechanics alone is not able to describe those, those small uh, constituents of matter. And even more, that um, electromagnetism is not able to describe those small constituents of matter. So, at the beginning of the 20th century, then, um, two or three theories um, arose, which uh, we think nowadays as describing the most fundamental features of the universe. And those theories are, um, first and foremost, quantum theory, and then relativity theory in its different forms, special relativity and, and general relativity. And so when we think of um, how the universe behaves, then we have to ask both of those theories um, um, how they treat determinism. And so it turns out that, for instance, when we take quantum mechanics or quantum theory in general, then um, on the one hand, quantum theory is as deterministic as classical mechanics. So the, so the main equation of the Schrodinger equation of, or in different guises, the dynamics of the quantum theory is as deterministic as the dynamics of classical mechanics. 
But this is not the end of the story, because it turns out that quantum theory also contains something called um, the collapse postulate. And that postulate makes the overall dynamics of, of quantum theory indeterministic. So, so the picture is that although a lot of the time when quantum systems evolve and um, when you describe quantum systems, then they behave as deterministically as like classical mechanics, but then once every once in a while you get this indeterministic evolution. And so um, at the end of the day, quantum theory says that the world is not deterministic. Um, now, quantum theory is actually plagued by, by something called the interpretation problem, which um, is basically um, a way to deal with um, the collapse postulate. And so it turns out that in order to put flesh on the mathematical framework of quantum mechanics or quantum theory in general, you have to also interpret the theory. And now it turns out that some interpretations of quantum theory um, tell that the world is indeterministic while others actually say that the world is deterministic. So the overall message you get from physics is that some of the theories tell that the world is deterministic while others tell it tell that the world is indeterministic. And so there is no one clean and neat answer um, from physics about whether the world is deterministic or indeterministic. So a well-known physicist Stephen Hawking once said that even those people who believe in the deterministic universe still um, check uh, whether the car is coming before crossing the road, and I can recommend that policy.